we've been doing Bible stories, and anytime you preach a series, and I always preach a series so that I at least have some kind of a map and a plan for a few Sundays at least, uh, when you come to a holiday, you have to ask yourself, okay, do we drop everything and do the holiday, or does it somehow fold in? Uh, when I originally started doing Bible stories in an effort to educate everybody about the Bible the way that I was educated, I was told Bible stories as a child, and my father would put us to sleep with them, and I would stay up and ask questions, and my brother would go right to sleep, but he also got the education. And uh, in fact, as, as children, when my dad became a youth minister, before he became lead pastor, uh, the, the teenagers would fight over uh, getting us on their team for Bible trivia, because even though we were little kids, we knew the Bible pretty well, because Dad had told us stories. And I want to pass that on to you, because there's a lot of basic stuff to know. You know, the ones who wrote the New Testament, we're all about the New Testament here, they had grown up on the Old Testament. And they knew all of this stuff. And so when I originally was planning out, you know, what story am I going to tell on what Sunday? I had originally planned to get to Jesus and do the resurrection this Easter Sunday. And some of you are probably in favor of that because you want to get through sermon series just about as fast as you can. Doesn't matter what the series is. You think if it's a series, all the sermons are the same, right? No? Okay. Okay. They're not, but some people do. I was preaching through Matthew one time at a previous church, and this little old lady, God bless her heart, she thought every sermon was the same because they were all from Matthew, even though it covers all different kinds of topics and everything else. And who knows, I probably repeated myself a whole lot like I tend to do. But I thought, you know what, let's slow down. Let's get, all the, let's get mo more of the stories of the Bible, and I bet I can get it to where the story of Passover lands on Easter. Now, if you don't know what I mean by Passover or the Exodus, um, uh, it is the time when God's peoples were slaves in the land of Egypt, and they had been living there for 400 years. They had been in good standing with the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. We call him the Pharaoh. That's, that's the Hebrew version of the Egyptian word. They had been in good standing with Pharaoh when they moved down there but over the course of 400 years, there arose a Pharaoh in Egypt that did not know the Israelites. And they had grown to a great number within Pharaoh's own borders, but they had maintained their own separate identity. So naturally, he began to think that this was a national security crisis, having all these foreigners with different beliefs and different values and everything living right within his borders. And so he started to press them into hard service. They went from whatever their... Uh, rank as, you know, foreign citizens was before to being manual labor slaves. And, and we always have pictures in our minds of them building the pyramids, but that's not really accurate. The Bible says they built storage cities for Pharaoh so that they could store grain and everything. And they were hard laborers and they had taskmasters with whips over them. In fact, the, the imagery is so similar to the awful, horrible thing that was slavery in this country that the abolitionists often use the imagery from the Bible of the Hebrews being slaves in Egypt to, to push back the problem of slavery and, and racism that we had it have in this country. And so, um, and, and God decided that a very unique individual was needed to solve this problem. You know, when the people of Israel were oppressed, they cried out to the God of their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it probably felt like their God did not hear them. You ever feel like that? You ever feel like you're going through something and you call out to the almighty God of the universe? Maybe you're not that religious. Maybe you don't know what his name is. Maybe you don't have a great opinion formed on exactly who he is and what he's like. But there's got to be an ultimate reality out there somewhere. Or maybe sometimes I know in our modern culture, we, we don't refer to the ultimate reality behind the universe. We just say the universe, you know, the universe is out to get me. The universe just doesn't care about me. My life is arranged to make sure that I suffer. And we all feel this way at some time or, or another. And... Um, many times what's helpful is to find out how much more other people are suffering. And you thought you had problems, you know, you've actually got it pretty good. But many times we're not imagining our suffering. It's really happening. And we wonder, is God there? Does God hear me? Uh, does God see what I'm going through? Well, God decided that there should be a rather unique individual comes onto the scene. And so 
as Pharaoh is oppressing the people, one of the things he does is he tries to commit genocide, thinking that they will not be able to raise an army if I kill all of their male babies. And so Pharaoh is out to, he sends his soldiers out to kill all the male babies. We covered a lot of this last Sunday leading up to this. One mother hides her baby in the home until she can hide him no more. She makes a basket for him that'll float. She uses tar to make sure that it is watertight and she puts it in the bulrushes in the Nile River and leaves the older sister there to watch the baby and make sure nothing happens. Well, something happens. A daughter of Pharaoh, a princess of Egypt, is bathing there with her servants, with her handmaidens. And they hear a baby cry or something and she says, bring me that basket. Let's see what's in there. And they open it up and lo and behold, there's a baby. What every princess wants. Oh, I thought that would get a laugh. Um, but, but ironically, she thinks to herself, well, this Hebrew baby is being hid here so that my father can't kill it. I'm going to adopt it because what could one Hebrew baby hurt? So for 40 years, he was raised as a prince in Egypt, educated as an Egyptian. I think he knew that he was not an Egyptian. Number one, I, I, I think the two races probably looked different enough that he, you just couldn't hide the fact from him. All the, every time we tell the story, usually he has some event in his adult life where he discovers he's actually a Hebrew, but who knows? Who know? We could debate that forever, I think. But he sees a taskmaster mistreating a fellow Hebrew, and he waits until that man is alone. The Bible says he looked one way and he looks another and he kills that taskmaster and buries him in the sand, thinking he had got clean away with it. The next day, when he interrupts two Hebrews arguing with each other, hey, hey, guys, 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 we are on the same side. One of them turns to Moses. You ever, you ever hate getting interrupted in an argument? You hate getting interrupted in the argument because you're right, right? And, and so someone is stopping you from being right. That's exactly right. So you're just as angry at the person who's trying to make peace here. One of them turns to Moses and said, if we don't stop fighting, what are you do, going to do? Kill us like you did that Egyptian the other day? Oh, Moses is caught. And then the next thing he hears is that Pharaoh knows that he killed this man and he is out to get him. So Moses flees into the wilderness of Midian. Now, to city people from Egypt, it's wilderness. But to the Midianite tribes that live out there, it's home. Amen. We live out in the country here. This is the wilderness to some people that we live in here. But we know that it's home, right? And, and so he encounters a family that takes him in. He marries the daughter. He becomes a shepherd for his father-in-law. His father-in-law is the priest of Midian. He has a clue. We don't know how much he knows about the one true God, but he seems to know something about the one true God. And in the course of 40 years, Moses' life is conveniently split into 40-year chapters. 40 years, a prince of Egypt, 40 years in the a shepherd in Midian, by the time he's 80, he's finally ready to enter the ministry. And so however old you are, God has a plan for your life, all right? And he's been a father and a shepherd, living the, the simple life out in the country. He sees something in the distance. That doesn't look right. We've been training with our security team. That just don't look right. You got to go check it out if it just don't look right. He said that doesn't look right. He went to that mountain, went up on that mountain, and there was a bush that was on fire. And yet the leaves and the twigs and the branches were not consumed. And just as he was thinking, what on earth is going on? What kind of fire does not consume what it is burning? He hears a voice from God that says, take off your shoes, Moses, for you are standing on holy ground. And he did. He took his shoes off. He's standing on holy ground. And he says, I'm the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I have heard the cry of my people. I see the oppression that they are under. I am sending you to deliver them from it. So this is a very unique individual, a Hebrew at heart, raised as an Egyptian and familiar with the Midianite backcountry and wilderness that he will later, will later lead the children of Israel through. And they have a whole long conversation. And uh, I know that we're worried about getting out on time today. We've got some driving to do today. So we're a little worried about it too. I encourage you to go and read the whole story. The book of Exodus is fascinating. The book of Exodus is fascinating because, and, and here's something that I never thought about, even though I grew up with all of these stories. I have heard of a big church out West 
they developed their own curriculum for their set free programs. If you're going to overcome addiction, overcome habitual sin, overcome all of these things. And really, it's just the gospel. You tell people that Jesus can set them free and you listen to their problems and everything. But their textbook, they decided their textbook should be the book of Exodus. Because we are all slaves to sin. And God doesn't just come and show up and speak magic words over you and boom, you're free. Sometimes we make it sound like that, but the Exodus tells us of a process. The Exodus tells us of a process where God shows up. He gives you that promise. I'm going to set you free. And throughout the process, sometimes it looks like God was lying. He's not setting us free. He made Pharaoh mad. Pharaoh is just going to make us work even harder. They turn, they turn on Moses several times. What are you doing? You're go, every time you go and talk to Pharaoh, he gets mad at us and he does something that, uh, to us that makes our lives even more miserable. And one of the times that they chew out Moses, Moses turns around and chews out God. God, you promised everything would be great. And the chapter ends with, and you haven't delivered your people at all. Poor Moses. He doesn't have a copy of the book of Exodus. He doesn't know it's only like a chapter 11 or something like that, you know. Poor Moses. That's, that's where we are. Sometimes we're in that chapter of Exodus and we don't know that we are well on our way to being delivered. But it sure doesn't feel like it right now sometimes, you know. Whatever now you're going through. God sends ten plagues and He promises Moses something that does not sound like a very good promise at all. He promises that He is going to harden Pharaoh's heart so that Pharaoh will not let them go. God wants the world and all of the generations of Israelites that come after this to know and to be able to tell the story of how God didn't just send one plague or five plagues. God sent ten plagues. Pharaoh stood up to God and Pharaoh got made a fool of. Pharaoh is not a God. The, God, the other gods that the Egyptians worshipped, they were inferior false gods compared to the God of the Israelites. That is the message of the whole story. God is going to harden Pharaoh's heart so that God can go the full length and go to drastic measures and show that he is God over all the earth. Doesn't matter what superpower you are president of or king of or emperor of, even if you are the most powerful man in the world or human being in the world, you are still just a human being. You are still mortal. And so all of us need to humble ourselves before God and God humbles Pharaoh. They go through nine plagues, which is where I left off last Sunday. They go through nine plagues, darkness, gnats, um, you know, Democrat primaries, you know, nasty stuff. And, and uh, get ready, it's going to be a bloodbath. Um, but anyways, uh, they go through the nine plagues. They come to the tenth plague. It's easy to get the nine plagues confused. Gnats, flies, frogs, darkness, boils, um, nastiness, just terrible things. But then that last one is really the, the very important one where uh, the Lord says that the firstborn of all Egypt is going to die. Now, we don't celebrate this fact, okay? We, even in the Passover meal that, that commemorates, we don't maybe even be careful with the word celebrate, just say commemorates. When the Jews eat their Passover meal, there are bitter herbs that they eat to represent the bitterness that all those firstborns had to die before they could be set free from Egypt. And it is bitterness. It is joyful. They have sweet stuff that they eat at Passover for the joy of being set free, but bitterness over the lives that had to be taken. And, and in Exodus, we see that freedom didn't come without some sort of death and destruction. It had to be paid for. In, and the Egyptians are kind of the bad guys. So in the story of the Exodus, the bad guys have to die in order for the good guys to go free. But we come to the story of Jesus uh, 1,600 years later, and Jesus is the good guy. And instead of killing the bad guys, we who are in rebellion, we who are in sin, we who uh, don't want to honor God, we want to go our own way, instead of killing us, the one that dies is Jesus. And He dies for us. Jesus pays the price. But this is a world where everything is purchased in blood and sweat and tears. 
And if you want to make it in life, you've got to work hard and it's going to take its toll on you. And raising kids is going to take its toll on you. And all the good things you want to do in life, it's going to take its toll on you. Jesus wanted to save the world. It took its toll on him. This isn't some namby-pamby religion where we give you something to feel good about and you go home and feeling good until the next time that you don't feel good. And so you've got to come back and get filled back up. This is a religion where someone died for you. This is a religion where God paid a big price in order to pay for the freedom that you don't deserve. And we may not like it when we have to talk about the reality of sin. It's ugly. I don't like people telling me that I'm wrong. I don't like telling people telling me that I'm sinful. But we got to tell you the truth about that before we can get to the truth that God has made a way to set you free. In the Bible, we read Exodus 12, 1 through 13. This, this last plague came with special instructions. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be for, be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses. A lamb for a household. If the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, you shall make for your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning, you shall burn in this manner. You shall eat it with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hands. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night. And I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for all that you've given us, Lord. And we thank you, O oh Lord, that you are willing to make the sacrifice the sacrifice that our death that we earned would go to Jesus instead. Lord, we thank you for this monumental thing that you have done for us. Oh, Lord, forgive us for telling ourselves it wasn't a big deal. Forgive us for acting like our sin is something that you should just wink and smile at and ignore. Forgive us for not understanding the extent to which we have hurt your creation and hurt those around us. Lord, forgive us our selfishness. Forgive us our uh, worship of other things besides you. Father, help us to take the process of freedom seriously that we would go through the wilderness and come out in the promised land. We thank you for guiding us. We thank you for providing the way. In Jesus' name, amen. The children of Israel had very specific instructions. Not only was this to be what they were to do that night, because the angel of death was coming, but this was what they were supposed to do every year on this date for the rest of their generations. And they still celebrate this uh, they, this year. They started Friday night, I found out. I looked it up on the Internet. It doesn't always coincide with Easter. It used to always coincide with Easter, but uh, the Catholics changed that a thousand years ago when everybody was still Catholic and all that good stuff. But um, even today, they still celebrate or commemorate what they are to do is they are to slaughter a lamb for dinner and they are to eat all of it. Now I want you to understand Moses has told the children of Israel forever. Now it feels like God is doing something. God is going to get us set free. Be patient. It's coming. Be patient. It's coming. God says tonight's the night. No leftovers in the fridge. You are moving tomorrow. So you've got to roast this lamb and you've got to eat it all because there is no room for leftovers in the caravan. This is an act of faith. We are leaving Egypt tomorrow. Eat the whole lamb. And, of course, take the blood 
paint the doorposts. Now, when I was a kid, I didn't know what a lentil, a lentil is a kind of bean. I didn't even know that what that kind of lentil was. OK, this is not a bean. The, the doorposts are the upright portions on the doorposts and that cross beam. I would just call that a doorpost, too, but it's a lentil. And you paint that blood on there. All right. Now, God knows who's an Egyptian and who's an Israelite. But God did not have the angel of death only sh strike the households of the Egyptians and leave the Israelites alone. The angel of death was to strike every household that had not in faith painted that blood of that lamb on their doorposts and pass over and not strike the households that had blood on that doorpost. And so if you were an Israelite, but you thought this Moses guy was overrated and you trusted him before and you weren't going to have faith in what he had to say now and you didn't do what he said, guess what? The firstborn of your household was going to die just like an Egyptian. And maybe you weren't an Israelite. But you heard the word and you decided, I want the angel of death to pass over my house and not make a stop. Perhaps you would eat a lamb. Perhaps you would paint that lamb's blood on your doorposts and lintel. And that angel and, and that would be an act of faith, wouldn't it? I believe what Moses said. I believe in the God of the Israelites and I'm scared of the angel of death. So I'm going to avoid it. That would be an act of faith. To paint the doorposts with that blood. And so it's not just being an Israelite that saves you. It is the act of faith. It is believing the word that God gave to Moses. That saves you from the angel of death. And I should probably also pause to explain that that firstborn is going to inherit everything, right? That's your next generation of leaders in that ancient world mindset. And God just wiped them all out in one night. Can you believe it? It's just crazy. What kind of message would that send to the Egyptians? That, to me, that seems that that message would send, the message sent to the Egyptians would be, I'm the God that owns your entire population. And I symbolize that by striking your firstborn, your future household leaders. So this was not a happy thing. This is not a good thing. This is bittersweet. This is how God rescued his people from a life of slavery and, and degradation. But it came at a heavy price. And so the children of Israel commemorate this every year with a Passover meal. In fact, as Jesus was going to be going to the cross, he and his disciples at Passover time celebrated that last supper. We got a copy of Leonardo da Vinci's version right there. It's very Roman and Italian. Didn't look a thing like that. They didn't sit up at tables like that back in G. That's I. Sh I should just stop talking about that. Sorry. Move along, Travis. They commemorated. They ate the bread. They took the cup, all in accordance with the tradition that was already sixteen hundred years old at the time. Many many centuries they had been doing this. But at that last supper, Jesus knew he was going to the cross and he told them that as they broke that unleavened bread, remember, no leftovers, no time to let the bread rise, no saving some of the bread so that you will have a starter for your next loaf because we are leaving tomorrow. So God had commanded unleavened, pardon me, unleavened bread only. And to commemorate that, they break the unleavened bread and they pass it around. But Jesus, Jesus at his Passover meal says, Crack, this is my body broken for you. And they drink a cup. And I, I learned that there's actually four cups of wine that you drink together at the Passover meal. But after the meal, you drink the third cup. It's all very specifically ordered. And he drinks that cup with them. They all drink it together. And he says, this is my blood shed for you. And then the last cup, the cup of the kingdom, he skips. I will not drink this with you again until we are in the kingdom. And so Jesus is telling us 
that as big and awesome and monumental as the Exodus story is, the story of Passover, and I was flipping through the channels last night and caught the Ten Commandments on ABC. Amen. Hallelujah. There's nothing that makes my Easter like seeing Charlton Heston and Yule Brenner just shout at each other. You know what I mean? I love. It's a good movie, and they should never remake it because... No, bad, 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 bad people, bad Hollywood, bad. And uh, it, it just stands on its own. It's terrific. And they, they don't sugarcoat anything. Angel of death looks like a low-lying fog coming in. There's just nothing you can do about it. There's just no way to stop it, you know. But as much drama as there is in that story to tell your children for Hollywood to make a movie out of and all that good stuff, it was only serving to point forward to a lamb that was coming. You see, in those households where they, sac where they killed the lamb and ate it and painted the blood on doorposts, either the lamb died or your firstborn son died. And so instead of your firstborn son being killed by the death angel, you would kill that lamb. That lamb was a substitute. And it point forward to someday... When John the Baptist points at Jesus and, and because he is a prophet and the Lord is speaking to him and the Holy Spirit, he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is going to be the sacrificial lamb instead of you dying and going to hell and paying the price for all the things that you have done and thought about doing and your sinful nature and everything. Jesus goes to the cross and dies. And publicly suffers a shameful execution like he is the worst of criminals. Even though he's never done anything wrong. And it was either him or you. God elected to sacrifice Jesus instead of allow us to die. Even though it was his own rules that condemned us. Even though he hates sin and loves perfection. And there is no shadow of turning within him. He looked at sinful beings and said, I can make them perfect. I can pay for their sins another way. And I can rescue them. And so not only are the children of Israel super excited to no longer be slaves in Egypt. We should be overjoyed on this day that we have chosen every year since to commemorate the fact that Jesus rose from the tomb, that though he died to pay for our sins, death had no hold over him. Jesus is more powerful than death, and he leads us all into a resurrection. Your eternal life does not start when you die if you're a child of God. It starts when you become a child of God. And you're in the childhood stages now. I don't care if you're Philip Fields at 103 years old. You're just a baby compared to the rest of eternity that you're going to spend with God. And so, folks, I hope that as we take the Lord's Supper, and I'm going to ask my deacons to go on ahead and come forward, that you would remember the Passover and that you would remember um, what it took for God to set the children of Israel free and what it took for God to set us free.